Back in the mid to late aughts, I had a friend who asked me to be a reader on her master's thesis. Now, for y'all who aren't familiar, master's thesis usually have a committee of three members, and at my university, they allowed two readers. The way my friend's thesis worked, the committee members, they couldn't be bothered. They only did the final evaluation and voted if she passed or not. It was us, the readers, who didn't get a vote, who did all the hands-on day-to-day advising. Randy, your stories are fine and all, but what does this one have anything to do with a video about Snow White? <laughs> My friend's topic? The Marxist feminist deconstruction of traditional fairy tales. What? Randy, Marxism isn't exactly your cup of tea. Why would you be involved in such a project? First off, I'm comfortable, even enjoy, having my ideas challenged. Iron sharpens iron. Second, my friend asked me. And third, the reason why my friend asked me. She wanted somebody on her committee that was philosophically, ideologically opposed to her arguments. My job was to destroy her arguments. <laughs> her committee hated my guts. The feeling was mutual. These academic corporate feminists, yes, I'm being redundant, told my friend she could never be a true feminist because she was Asian. And these are the good guys, or gals, whatever. This was the first time I was exposed to intersectional theory. And it was when I first learned that academic corporate feminism Yes, I'm being redundant, loathes Snow White, in particular Disney's animated Snow White. Why, you all might ask? It's because they argue Snow White reinforces traditional stereotypical gender roles. Snow White is forced into a life of servitude and drudgery. She's denied her agency. They've been wanting to burn it to the ground for a long time. Disney's live-action remake of Snow White is going to be the wet dream of every academic and corporate feminist. Yes, I'm being redundant. <laughs> we finally have our hands on it. We can now get rid of those problematic elements and tell the story that promotes our values. They don't realize they're the villains in this little tale. One of the mantras of this channel if you're going to mess around with symbolism, you better know what you're doing. Sometimes a broom is more than a broom. Snow White has just lost that sweet princess gig, and she is fired in one of the most brutal ways possible. She was almost murdered. She knows who ordered the hit. Her stepmother. She can't go home. She is now lost and alone in the forest with the only thing that she owns, the clothes on her back. Today, we hear the word forest, we think of park, nature, beautiful. What's the big deal? You have to remember, though, that back in the Middle Ages, forests were synonymous with danger and death. You got lost in the forest, more often than not, you weren't coming home. An argument could be made that the forester didn't let Snow White go out of kindness. Why have blood on your hands when the forest will do the dirty work for you? Let Snow White run off, and then in a couple of days, come back and find what remains of her corpse. How does Snow White respond to having her life completely turned upside down, being on the razor's edge of survival? With joy and happiness. Snow White is so innocent and pure of heart that one of the biggest dangers that she faces, the wild animals, they come out and befriend her. Randy, those animals are so cute and cuddly. How could they be a danger to anyone? <laughs> Look up how many people are killed by deer every year. And I ain't talking about car accidents either. Cute and cuddly, my <laughs> It's the animals that tell Snow White of a place where she can live. A little house buried deep in the woods, hidden from the queen and her minions. There's a catch, though. There's always a catch. The house ain't abandoned. It belongs to somebody. She's going to need to get their permission if she wants to live there. Remember, Snow White is a fugitive with a death warrant on her head. Whoever lives in this little house, if they take her in, they will be going against the government and putting their own lives at risk. 
They have every incentive in the world to tell Snow White, you take your little princess butt and get out of here and don't come back. And by the way, if the authorities come knocking, we're going to tell them exactly which direction you went. Snow White is going to have to be a world-class saleswoman to convince somebody to let her stay under these circumstances. This is where the academic and corporate feminists, yes, I'm being redundant, go nuts. But she demeans herself as a woman by cleaning and cooking. Why? If the argument is because she's a woman, she's required to cook and clean, then yeah, that's wrong. But if you're saying because she's a woman, cooking and cleaning is beneath her, that's wrong too. Nobody is above cooking and cleaning. It all depends on the context. As you're going to see, though, academic and corporate feminists, yes, I'm being redundant, could care less about cooking and cleaning. It's a justification, an excuse to cover up what really pisses them off, feminine power. The point of Snow White cleaning the house isn't about cleaning the house. The seven dwarves are a family, but something's missing in their lives, something they don't even realize is missing, women. When they first encounter the influence of a woman, they resist, they reject it. They quickly realize, though, that it's Snow White who completes their family, makes their house into a home. I often hear people who are defending Snow White cooking and cleaning saying, it's a quid pro quo. I scratch your back, you scratch my back. No. If it was that simple, Snow White would just be the seven dwarves maid. It would be an employer-employee relationship. But their relationship goes much deeper. Snow White becomes the Seven Dwarves' mother. Now we're getting to the heart of the matter. The real reason academic and corporate feminists, yes, I'm being redundant, hate Snow White. Motherhood. Motherhood isn't about getting pregnant, cranking out babies. It's not about blood relationships. It's about nurturing. When Snow White encounters the empty, dirty house, the first thing she does, she chooses to cook she chooses to clean. What she does is irrelevant. Why she does it is what matters. Choosing to do something of her own free will lays the foundation for everything that happens afterwards. It shows she's a kind person, but it also shows an incredible amount of mental flexibility. Snow White is a princess. She's probably never cleaned or cooked in her life. But she realizes that her social status has come way down. The first thing she does when she encounters the dirty house is an act of humility. When the dwarves discover their house has been cleaned, their reaction isn't about time some woman came and cleaned our house for us. On the contrary, they ain't happy that somebody messed with their stuff. They like their dust and cobwebs. They like the sugar buildup on the rims of their coffee cups. Cleaning the house doesn't earn Snow White brownie points with the doors. To the contrary, it hurts her cause, but it reveals her mindset, the same mindset she reveals as soon as she starts to interact with the doors. Snow White is so kind, sweet, loving, nurturing, the dwarves turn into little boys. She instantly becomes their mother. We see this new relationship begin to play out at supper. Snow White says, before we eat, you need to go wash up. The dwarves could have said, listen here, wench. Our house, our stuff, our dishes, our food. You want us to let you live here and have us protect you from the queen? You shut your cake hole and hand over the food. They don't. The dwarves have no interest in washing up before dinner. They've never washed up before dinner. They don't see the point in it, so they lie. Yeah, 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 we washed up earlier. Let's eat. By lying, the dwarves are acknowledging Snow White's moral authority. They're acknowledging she has the right to make the rules. But they don't want to wash up. So like naughty little boys, they're trying to weasel their way out of it. Like all mothers, Snow White sees through the lie. But how she handles it, again, reveals her loving, nurturing nature. Oh, it's been a while since you washed your hands. Let's see them. And of course, their hands are filthy. Snow White sends them off. Now, nope. clean hands before dinner. 
And when Grumpy openly defies her, no, meh, she says, please for me. When Grumpy continues to defy Snow White, insisting, I'm not going to wash, the other dwarves mug him, beat the stuffing out of him, force him to wash. The dwarves were prepared to use violence to enforce Snow White's moral authority, even with each other. Where does Snow White get her moral authority? From her loving, nurturing nature made manifest by her actions. It's not just the cooking and cleaning. Later in the evening, she sings and dances with them. And then at night, she tucks them into bed, prays with them. For all intents and purposes, she is now their mother. Going all the way back to the Greeks, Western culture has had the idea that women nurture civilization. And by women nurturing men, it allows men to become civilized. We see this idea being played out in Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. The dwarves have become feral. They're half wild. When Snow White nurtures them, she civilizes them. They become good citizens and their lives are better off because of Snow White. Cooking and cleaning were just a means to an end. There are lots of ways Snow White could have manifested her nurturing nature. But it was the dwarves' particular circumstances that dictated the particular tactics that Snow White would employ. Removing cooking and cleaning destroys the story, destroys Snow White's character, which is the agenda. Y'all will notice that after the controversy and backlash surrounding the live-action remake, the new trailer does everything in its power to remind us of the original animation. They're trying to say, no, 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 it's all been a big misunderstanding. No, we're not changing anything. It's going to be the exact story you know and love. But they can't help themselves. They have to show their contempt for both the original story and us, the audience. Intersectional theory says you can't portray a woman cooking and cleaning. It demeans her, diminishes her power. Rachel Zegler's Snow White is going to make the doors clean their own house. We have a problem. Well, actually, we have two problems. Why are the doors helping Snow White in the first place? And what gives Snow White the authority to tell the doors what to do? Make them clean their own house. Why would the dwarves put themselves at risk to help Snow White? Because she's a princess? First off, she ain't a princess anymore. And second, it's her identity that causes the problem, puts the dwarves at risk, makes them inclined to say, move along, young lady. Is Snow White going to pay the dwarves? You help me, and when I become queen, I will give you power and wealth. The dwarves just become Snow White's lackeys, mercenaries, her hired help. You're taking a story about altruism, love, and family, and turning it into one about a rich brat buying her way out of trouble. Are the dwarves going to help Snow White just because she's a woman? If that's the case, why are they required to help a woman? The second big problem, what gives Snow White the moral authority to tell the dwarves to clean their own house? Without moral authority, Snow White comes off as saying, now that I've agreed to live here, there's no way I'm staying in a dump like this. You clean this place up or I'm out of here. Tone deaf? It changes Snow White from a loving, nurturing mother figure into an arrogant, pretentious, narcissistic cow. Does Snow White derive her moral authority from the simple fact that she's a woman? I'm going to predict in the live action remake, yep. Snow White is going to derive her moral authority from the simple fact she's a woman. Academic and corporate feminists, yes, I'm being redundant, love, glory in the moral authority that society gives them because they're women. It enrages them the reason they're granted that moral authority. Academic and corporate feminists, yes, I'm being redundant, was founded upon hatred, hatred of other women. They resent the fact that their safety and security is dependent upon the goodwill of other women, women who have chosen to nurture men. That's why they hate motherhood, women being given power and moral authority because of their loving, nurturing nature. But then again, these are the same feminists who think 
white women only need apply. At any rate, I hope I've given you all something to think about. And until next time, y'all be safe. If you all are still here, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. While you're at it, why don't you like this video, subscribe to the channel, click that notification bell. You can hear me yammer on about something else next time. And feel free to share this video far and wide. Please like and subscribe. Please leave a comment.